You know, today I, I, I'm excited to, to share this message with you. Um, one of the things that, that, that is so important to me is that literally we see a move of God in our hearts. Amen. And, you know, I'm, I'm all about it. I, I think, you know, before we kind of get into this, you know, um, sometimes I think in church where we kind of tread lightly and we don't want to address certain things. But, you know, our, our, our culture is really messed up. And, you know, I, I've, been, I've been alive for a while. And, uh, and you know, and I, I've seen our nation change. And, you know, I, I, I've never seen it in this, this condition. But how many of you know that Jesus is still the answer? How, how many of you know that the Holy Spirit really wants to move? And I, and I really do believe that's the answer for our world today. It's not getting into debates, not getting into arguments. It's to let the, the move of the Holy Spirit, his love, really just get into people's hearts and change us. And, you know, um, kind of brings me to really kind of the intro to my message and um, on Tuesday night, I had the honor to, to kind of speak with our young adults. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And then uh, I hung around afterwards. Normally, by 9 o'clock, you know, I turn into a pumpkin. But I stayed a little later because these guys, you know, they're 9 o'clock. They're just getting awake. And, and anyway, and I got to talk to some of them. And one of them asked me a great question. You know, he was moving to San Francisco. I used to live in that region, but it was a long time ago. And uh, he, he sat there and he said, do you know a good church in San Francisco? I said, no, I have no idea. And then he asked a great question. He says, well, when I, look, when I go to churches, what should I look for? And I said, well, let me give you two things real quick. Number one, look for the, the truth being preached, the word of God. You know, we're not going to agree on everything, but the main points, you know, make sure that, that it's the truth of the word of God. Then I said the second thing. And this is the part that I want to kind of get on to today. I said, when you go in there, you should experience God. Man, I, I am so tired of church where you don't experience God. What, what does that mean, experience God? You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, cloud, it might look like a cloud in here right now, but it, it, it doesn't mean an actual cloud supposed to come down and, and, you know, and an angel speaks to us. But here's what it means, that when the worship happens, when the word happens, that the, that the spirit of God literally touches our heart. Now, there, now there's something that is something that's so important, and, and I kind of want to slow down right here. I don't want to rush forward into this, but, but we're living in a time where people ha are moving away from God. People are, are questioning the existence of God. And if we're not careful, we start trying to debate it. We start trying to reason it out. But, but I want you, it's always been this way, and it'll always be this way, is that the people who truly believe have been touched by God in their heart, not just their head, and that touch is they have faith in, and it transforms their life. And a gospel that doesn't transform your life is not the gospel we're talking about. We're talking about a gospel full of power. Yes. Let me say that one more time. We're talking about a gospel full of power. Now, I, I don't know where you're at today and maybe where you're at a place where you pastor, I'm not really used to that. Okay, we're not talking about something weird. We're not gonna be swinging from chandeliers. We don't have any here to swing from, <laughs> all right? We're not gonna be running down the aisle. Well, we might, but, but, that, but that's not the point. The point that we're really after is is that, that there should be a Holy Spirit touch. And, and one of the things that maybe some of you in this room are, are, are not used to is that Holy Spirit touch. You come in, maybe you come into church and, 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 and you have a lot of questions. That's, that's normal. You know, maybe you're like, you're trying to, to, to reason it out. Here's, here's something that I think is so important for us to understand. God, we are not a mind and a body. Now, there are some science, scientific teaching that, that gets into materialism and different parts of that that basically says that everything that composes who you are is composing your mind and your body. Well, you know, there's so many things you can't explain. I don't, I don't have time to get into all that, but, but just your conscience alone. You know, just, I mean, they can't even explain the conscience. You know why? 
Because your conscience doesn't come from your mind. It comes from your heart. It comes from your spirit. The Bible teaches us that we are a spirit. We live in a body and we have a mind. Our mind is our soul and it's our emotions and it's our will. But you're a spiritual being. Every person in this room, you're a spiritual being. So I don't think I am. Well, okay, that's cool. But, but if, if what we're saying is correct, every person in this room is going to stand before God, the spirit of all spirits. See, I, I think this life is just the beginning. I, I, I think, you know, we get so excited about 80, if we can live to we're 80, 85, 90, you know. I met somebody the other day, they were, you know, getting up 95. Well, it's cool. That's wonderful. But that's nothing compared to eternity. Amen. We're a spirit being, and what's been stolen from us is a spiritual side. And it's not cast by the friendly ghost. It's not weird. It's not off the wall. See, your spirit speaks to you all the time. It's your conscience. It's sometimes when you go to do something, it's like, oh, no, I shouldn't do that. And you do it anyway. Now, eventually your conscience will stop talking to you because you just kind of ignore it. But, when you, but it, it's that part of you that, that you kind of know what's right and wrong. It's the part of you when you come to church and, man, you're, you're bummed and you're messed up and you, you feel like that your life is useless. And, and then after the worship comes and, and the word comes forth, you walk out and all of a sudden you have hope. Where'd that come from? Your mind? Did you reason it out that an invisible God that you've never seen before is all of a sudden going to help you? Did your circumstances change? No. They're all the same. Let me tell you what changed. The Holy Spirit touched your heart. When the Holy Spirit touches your heart, it always produces hope. Now, what you do with that hope is up to you. So you can go, well, that hope, you know, that's just, you know, that was just an emotional response and you ignore it. You can say, well, that's from the pizza or, you know, the, I had a bad avocado yesterday, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, we, we can sit there and go, well, it's, it's all. The, and, and, and what happens is we reason away the move of God. You know, I, I, let me just stop right here with this service. So, I, I, it's very important that I'm just led by the Spirit here. You know, I, I've, I've seen miracles. I mean, I've seen miracles. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in the church. I'm not talking about like, uh, my headache went away. No, nothing wrong with that, okay? But, but I can't prove that. You know, I, I remember... I remember I, I was sitting there, it was my fir the first church that I worked at, and we had a girl diagnosed, actually a young lady, a young lady, she was diagnosed with leukemia, diagnosed, okay, we're not talking about she thought she had leukemia, diagnosed with leukemia. Pastor said, you know, you know, he asked me, to, I was the youth pastor there at the church, and I, you know, he said, would you pray for her? I, I didn't touch her. She's over, you know, the surface, it's a lot smaller than this, but she's over here somewhere. And I just reached out my hand like this. And I said, let's pray. And I pray. And when, it, when I when it began to pray, I could feel the Holy Spirit drop on me. And it was like, man, there was power there. And I spoke it and I just believed it. I didn't think anything about it. And I went back and, and the next week she comes back and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. She goes, I went back to the doctor. I've had tests done. It's gone. It's gone. You know, and, and you say, well, well that's just, that just happened to happen. No, I, I don't believe that. I believe there's a Holy Spirit that wants to move in our life. And I understand, and, there, and through this, let me tell you something else. In this room, there's all kinds of miracles. People with testimonies of how the Holy Spirit has moved in their life. And, and, and we have to be so careful that, that literally our faith is based on reason rather than by the touch of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor, that seems so, you know, I, I don't know about that. Let, let, look at what the Bible has to say. Romans 8, 16. I'm reading out of the Message Bible, all right? And the, and the Message Bible says this. God's Spirit. Now, I want you to notice whose spirit? God's. Does what? It touches our minds. 
our reasoning, our emotions, God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is. We know who we are, father and children. The most important decision in your life is your eternal destination. It is not marriage, all right? It is not your job. It is your eternal de destination. And what is it based on? What confirms it? A touch from the Spirit of God to your spirit. And see, and part of the problem is, is that there's not enough teaching on that in the church. We don't, we don't major on that. And then we have a lot of people who are trying to reason it out. They're like, well, that's a touch, but tomorrow I feel differently. And how do I reason that out? I can't see God. Da, 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 da. And we explain away our faith. But see, our faith is in that touch. When you get saved, why do you get saved? How do you get saved? Do you sit there and articulate and reason it out and go, well, you know, there, there, there might be because of this and because of that. I think there might, might be a God, so I'm going to give him everything I have. That doesn't even make sense. You won't do it. See, the reason you, do, you give him everything you have is because that hope touches you. You sense it in your heart. It's like your sixth sense. And you take that hope and you say, I believe. And the struggle is walking that out every day. That struggle is believing when it seems like the circumstances go against you. It's, it's, it's the struggle of, you know, there's a God and sometimes I don't feel him. But, but we're here to tell you that that's what faith is. Faith is standing on that touch. It's sometimes reminding yourself. Sometimes, you know, believe it or not, you know, some of you might not think I ever struggle with this, but there's sometimes I struggle with doubt. I mean, you, you have a really bad day, things go bad, and you know, it just some days just feel sour. You, come on, everybody know, I'm, I'm a human just like you, and I'm sitting there, and you know what I do? I go back and I remember. And I go, dumb, I'm, I'm back in, God, sorry. Just, I had a, had a, you know, a little lapse there for a second because I got into emotionalism and I got into reason. And I get back over into faith. See, your faith is based on the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And, and here's what bothers me. We're, we're not majoring on that anymore. In our churches, what we're doing is, that, is we're, we're just giving out, you know, some human reasoning. And, and, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit doesn't speak anymore. We're, we're shutting them down on Sunday mornings because some people might not like it. We're not shutting down anything, folks. We want the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. You know, I, I read something, and, and there, there's this teaching's going around, it's, it's pretty predominant, that when the last disciple died, which was John, by the way, in case you're wondering, John the Beloved, he died somewhere around 95 AD, Masamenos, all right? And, and I know, I just got through a little bit of that Spanish out that I know. And, and, and um, they say that all the miracles stopped at 95 AD, and that God no longer speaks by his spirit, only by his word. Only by his word. So what it does is it exalts the word of God, and I, and I believe the word of God is mega important. But the, the, word, the purpose of the word of God is not just to reason it out. And so then we, we, we have ministers that go, spend all kinds of time in Bible school. And what they're doing is they're learning, you know, about the word. They're learning all the reasoning about the word. And they come out. And what they're preaching is they're preaching some human wisdom, but it's dead. It's not full of life. Yeah. You know, I, I actually went to a Bible school in California. And, and I won't mention the name or anything, but it was, you know, it was a um, very well-renowned Bible school. And I was going there. And I didn't really feel like I was supposed to go there, but it was close to home. And, and, and so I went there and, 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 you know, my first semester, the whole time, I just didn't feel right. And then I read a scripture and it says, everything produces after its own kind. In other words, I was going to end up like the teachers at the Bible school. And I went and looked at their lives. They were super educated. 
They, they, they knew a lot about the Bible, but there was no power. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? There was no life. Why? Because it wasn't about the Holy Spirit. It's about the education of the word of God. And I got out of there and I followed God. God told me to go halfway across the, the, the uh, nation to, to Kenneth Hagin Ministries and to a Bible school that taught about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's, there are people today that teach that you can't be led by the Holy Spirit anymore, just the word of God. That is not biblical. Romans 8.15 says, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I want you to know, the greatest thing I learned in Bible school wasn't about the book of Genesis or any book in the Bible. It was about learning how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to recognize that hope when it hits my heart and connecting with it. The whole reason I'm here is because I, I did that. The whole reason. Listen, do do you understand that coming here made no sense? You don't know what it was like. This church had had six splits in six years. There was not a pastor who could stick here. And God told me to come here. I didn't want to. I'm, I'm being honest. I did not want to come. I did not. I was born in Texas. I did not want to come back to Texas. I didn't want to. And God says, you're to come. And I said, okay. And I came and, and I'm telling you, it was trouble. The capital T. I had six of my friends come and speak for me. They didn't tell me this at the time they spoke, thank God. But 10 years later, this is what they said to me. They said, we thought you'd never make it. Why did we make it? Because I'm so good. No, because I obeyed God. God told me to come. I didn't, it was against reasoning. It was against my own will. It was against my emotions, but I came anyway. And listen, when it's God's will, it's his bill. Let me, let me say that again, because some of you need to hear this. Some of you, God has spoken something to you. And you, you haven't seen it come to pass yet. And you're wondering, is it really ever, was it really God? It is God. Just be patient. It took five years for me to see anything. It took eight years before we started to see something bust loose. And ever, about eight years till now, about 20 years later, almost 20 years later, we've just seen God do some incredible things. If we didn't systematize it, we didn't figure it out. It was God. We obey God. God does some things in your marriage. He does some things with your kids. He does some things in your finances. He does some things in your purpose. Does that make sense? But you have to understand that. Let, let, me, let me move on. I got to get past the introduction here. All right. Let, let's, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Now, before I read this, this is really important for you to get. And um, I need to move on here. First Corinthians, Corinth is the place. Paul is writing a letter to Corinth. Corinth is, is, a, is a Greek city. And it was basically known to be um, rather immoral. In fact, it, they would have this term, you know, like they would call people a Corinthian. They, not that they're from Corinth. They're just acting like a Corinthian. What does that mean? They were, all, they were immoral. They were all about chasing after pleasure. And they were loose and free and usually, you know, pretty well off. That was a Corinthian. Paul comes in to this, into this place and he's about to give out the message of the gospel for the first time to these guys. Now, now let me explain something. The apostle Paul is as smart as they come. He's one of the best minds of his generation. He's a brilliant man. He, could, he was, he was um, educated in debate and, and human wisdom. And so here comes this super smart guy. And most places when he walks in the room, he's the smartest guy. And he's speaking to this immoral group. What, what's he going to say? And, and he tells us, here in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. Now listen to this. So that your faith 
might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, he could have came in and he could have explained the entire Old Testament. He could have gone through all the different laws. He could have gone through all the different supposedly godly things. But he didn't preach it. He preached the power of God. Why? Because let me tell you something. Wisdom makes adjustments in your life. The spirit of God makes transformation in your life. See, if, if, if you just hear about, oh, okay, I can do this in my marriage, you can make adjustments in your marriage. You know, if, if you hear about how to handle money, you can make adjustments in how you handle your finances and you can make adjustments in how you behave with people and all those type of things. But that's not transformational, it's an adjustment. And what we have too much in churches is people just making adjustments and there's really not life change. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, I said, when the Holy Spirit comes in, when the Holy Spirit comes in, there is transformation. See, what we need is we need husbands not to make adjustments, but to be changed. We need wives not to make adjustments, but to be changed. We need parents not to make adjustments, but to be changed. We need leaders, come on, not just to make some adjustments, but to be radically changed into God's image. You look in the Bible and, and every man and woman of God who did anything at all literally were transformed. Moses went from a shy stutterer who wanted to hide out on the backside of the wilderness to one of the greatest vocal leaders ever who saw maybe the greatest miracles of anyone. We see Gideon, who's a scaredy cat from a horrible tribe, not doing anything. Now, all of a sudden, leading a nation and defeating a powerful enemy. We see Paul, who used to be Saul, who was all about his mind, all of a sudden learning how to move in the spirit. We see Peter, who's impetuous, who's constantly you know, jumping out and impulsive, all of a sudden become the rock of the church. See, the problem is, can you believe that for yourself? Can you believe that for yourself or do you want to? Do you want to believe that for yourself? Because God wants to create a new image inside of you that's different than your upbringing. God wants to create a new purpose for you. That's different than just your job. Now, I'm not telling you to quit your job. God can use your job. I'm not saying that. But, but what happens is, is our purpose is all wrapped around us. It's around about what house can I get? What car can I drive? 3.5 children, you know, all those kind of things. That half a child's a pain. But anyway, <laughs> you know, and it's like we're chasing the American dream. That's turned into American nightmare. And, and God has something bigger for you. I said, God has something bigger for you. See, and, and you have to make a decision what you're going to do with it. You know, it's interesting to me that, you know, when I got saved, I was 16, I, I got saved in a little bitty church, about 120 people, and it never grew. I mean, if somebody got saved, I mean, in a year, if one person got saved, it's like revival there. And, 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 and they, they believed in the move of God. They believed in all those things. But man, it wasn't happening. And, and I remember sitting in that church and the preachers preaching. And most of those people had been in church their entire lives. I just got saved. They knew a whole much more of the Bible. They forgot more of the Bible than I knew. But they heard the same message that I did, come on. And this is their response. Boy, I'm, I can't believe we picked this color of carpet. These are literal arguments that happen. I'm not picking something out of the blue. We had a church split over the color of the carpet. One half wanted red, the other one wanted blue. People getting upset 
because somebody took their seat. How dare they? That's my, I've been sitting in that seat for 35 years. One of the biggest fiascos we had was somebody wore flip-flops to church. Oh, my gosh. You know, the chancla, you know. <laughs> if you're wearing chanclas to church, we're glad. Amen. We don't care. I mean, now I'm, I'm sitting in the same, listen, I'm sitting in the same service hearing the exact same message. This is what I'm hearing. Man, God wants to do some incredible things in my life. God has a, literally a destination, a spiritual destination, a spiritual purpose for my life. Every time I went to church, it was just like, what, what's next, God? The difference is the same spirit is moving. One person's receiving it, and another person sitting right next to them isn't. No, no, listen, listen. People, Jesus walked amongst the people. The Son of God. The Bible says that he had the Holy Spirit literally without limits. He's walking and people aren't receiving anything. One of the craziest stories was that there was a whole crowd that was gathered around Jesus and they're all wanting to touch him. It's like he's famous. And they wanted to touch him. And there's this one woman, she'd been bleeding for years. And she'd heard about Jesus. And she said, see, faith rose up. When she heard about Jesus, all of a sudden hope came up. Hope said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, that power, that Holy Spirit on him will heal me. See, and all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't even know she's around. He's just standing. And all these people are touching him. All of a sudden, she grabs a hold of his, of his um, robe. And when she did, Jesus turned around and he said, who touched me? All the disciples are going, there's like a hundred people touching you right now. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, yeah, but somebody touched me and power left me. And see, here's the cool, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go too much detail. It was illegal by Jewish law for her to be out in public because of her condition. And she said, it was me. And here's what Jesus said. He said, your faith has made you whole. That same day, man, she was completely and totally healed. Now, you know, I, here, here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. God's power is in the room. That power that healed that woman is in this room. You have to make a decision what you're going to do with it. See, what do you do when the word is spoken to you? Let me, let me, let me one final passage here, and, and it'll be a few minutes, and we'll kind of move forward here. But, but it's a great passage here in Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, and they said, the disciples said to him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so they're giving him, he's asking, what do the people say who I am? And, and, and they're telling him, basically, you're one of the prophets that come back from the dead. And I think this is so interesting to me that these people are making this decision because of human reasoning. And I, they, he kept saying, I'm the son of God, but they couldn't buy that. It made more sense to them that somebody was raised from the dead, which has never happened before. And, and, they, but, and they couldn't agree. Well, some say he's Jeremiah. Some say he's Isaiah. Some say he's John the Baptist. See, I have found that out in the world, and sometimes even in the church, there's a whole lot of people wondering who God is. And the reason why we have all these differing opinions is because we're going through our mind and not our heart. And there's, and there's a lot of people in your family that are trying to tell you this is God or this is church. Listen, that's not it. It's what's your heart speaking to you. Do you know that even if you've just gotten saved, you can tell whether something's accurate or not by your heart? 
I've had people come up to me and they said, you know, I've been to so-and-so church. And as soon as they said that, I knew it wasn't right. And they said, it just didn't seem right, but I, I just got saved. And I said, just follow your heart. So then Jesus carries on and, or goes on and he says this. He, he, Jesus, verse 14, um, verse 15, excuse me. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Then Simon Peter spoke up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. How did he know? By the touch of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He didn't say you may be. He said, this is who you are. See, that's what faith is. Faith grabs a hold of what the Spirit of God says, this is fact. And then Jesus makes a statement that's incredible. He's, in verse 18, he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I'm going to say this, and I may offend some of you. I'm not trying to. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? That, that there's some who teach that Peter that is the rock and, and the church was built on him. That's not what Jesus was talking about. And then people are trying to say that Peter was the first pope. No, look at it historically. He was not. All right, he was not the first pope. All right, there, there's no historical backing for that at all. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about that the, that the church was going to be built on Peter. The church is built on Jesus, not Peter. Does that make sense? And, but here's what he's saying. He's, the rock he's talking about is the revelation that Peter had of who he was. He's saying the church will be built on revelation of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. And he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what that is saying? That the churches aren't supposed to be built on systematized wisdom. They're supposed to be built on the move of the Holy Spirit. But it says more than that, your life. Because who is the church? We are. Where our life is supposed to be built on the Holy Spirit. When your life is built on the Holy Spirit, the devil doesn't have a chance. He may win a war, he may win a battle, but he can't win the war. Because the greater one lives on the inside of you. See, let me, let me tell you how your life changes. Your life changes and when you connect with the Holy Spirit, you hear the word of God and that word of God explodes on the inside of you and it shows you something you need to change. And it can happen to you at any point. I cannot tell you how many times that the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. I can't tell you how many times he's spoken to our staff and so many others in this church. This isn't a rarity. It's if you're open to it, the Spirit will speak to you. And he's shown me things over and over and over that I had to change in my life. And the reason he, he tells me is for my benefit, not for my harm. Amen. I had one dynamic time that happened. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was working at a church. And for those of you who are familiar with Tulsa, I was at a stoplight at 71st and Lewis. I, I had been asking God some questions about how I could move forward with my life. I've been studying the Bible in certain areas. Now, that particular day was no special day. I didn't have a special devotion with God or anything like that. I'm at a stoplight. And all of a sudden, I don't know why God chose then, but right, I, I saw an event that happened in my family. And that event was something that I had buried a long time ago and I didn't even realize that I had unforgiveness towards this person who did this thing who wasn't good. And, 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 it, and I, I didn't see it with my eyes. I saw it in my heart. I just saw the whole event and I remembered it. And I'm sitting there at a stoplight and I could feel the spirit of God come on me. And, and literally I, I started crying. You know, people around me are thinking, what in the world? I'm in the car by myself. And I'm like, God, I remember that. And you know what it was? It was my heavenly daddy pointing out, saying, son, you see this thing right here in your life? It's holding you back. 
the things you're wanting to do, this unforgiveness you don't even recognize. He says, you got to deal with this so I could do more through you. And I'm sitting there, I just said, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't even know I was doing it. And, I, and right there, I just broke down, you know, and all this happened at a stoplight. Just a few minutes, seconds, actually. And I said, God, I forgive them. I didn't even mean to hold a grudge. And the moment I did that, it was like somebody took a thousand pounds and dumped them off my shoulders and I felt free. And I'm driving back to work going, wow, that all happened at a stoplight. I wasn't even in church. Lee wasn't singing nothing. I was sitting in a car. Why? Because the Holy Spirit cares that much about each and every one of you in this room. You know, and, and listen, I, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to do things a little different. I feel like this, God's leading us. The first thing I want to deal with right now is where you're at with God. I, I, I want to make sure that you are right with God. What does that mean? That means that if you face death today, that you know you'd go to heaven. See, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you've never messed up or you won't mess up. Here's what it means, that you've given your life, you recognize Jesus Christ died on the cross, that you're messed up, that you need a Savior, and you've accepted him as your Savior. He's come into your life that very moment that you ask him to do that, and he forgives you from every sin you've ever done. He comes to live on the inside of you, that Holy Spirit we've been talking about, and you have an assurance that heaven's your eternal home. See, that, that's what we're talking about today. You can make that decision. And I, and I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to people's hearts right now. It's just that tug on the inside. It's not about your head. It's not about your emotions. It's about the tug in the heart. And, and you, you make that decision to make him the Lord of your life, to give him everything. You don't have to understand it all. You just make that decision. And as you do that, the Bible says he'll forgive you of every sin you've ever done. He'll come into your life to live, and heaven's your eternal home. Maybe you've never done that for the first time you need to, or maybe one time you did, but you've fallen away from God. You need to come back. Listen, if that's you, you're watching online, you're in the audience, you need to come to God for the first time or come back to him, we just put your hand up all over the building. Just put your hand up nice and high. Yeah, hands are going up. That's wonderful. And anybody else, one last time, just put your hand up nice and high. All right, that's great. Thank you so much for those hands. Now listen, you put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to lead you out in prayer. I want everybody in the room to repeat this prayer nice and loud. Listen, the folks who raise their hands, when you say these words, make a decision in your heart. It's a heart decision. The Bible says if you believe he was raised from the dead, you accept it in your life by making him Lord. That moment you're saved. Make that decision right now as you speak these words. You'll be forgiven. He comes to live on the inside of you. And heaven's your return home. Everybody repeat this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus that he died for me. I repent of my old life. And I ask you to come into my heart and to save me right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. I thank you because of my confession that I am forgiven, that you live in me, that heaven's my eternal home. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give it up for those who receive Christ.